Welcome to Cancer Newsline, a podcast series from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Cancer Newsline helps you stay current with the news on cancer research, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, providing the latest information on reducing your family's cancer risk. I'm your host, Lisa Garvin, and today our guest is Dr. Ian Lipsky. He's an associate professor in MD Anderson's Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine. He's an anesthesiologist who has tried medical hypnosis recently and found it to be pretty successful. Dr. Lipsky, what was your first experience with this? How did you come to incorporate it into your work? First, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me, Lisa. Several years ago, I attended a conference in Boston, and uh, this was a hypnosis conference through the Society for Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis. So after learning about this at a conference, when were you able to actually put this into practice? Yes. Yeah, so at the, at the conference, we learned about 20 hours of actual practice of clinical hypnosis. And first, let me dispel some, some myths about it. This is not mind control. Uh, we don't make people quack like ducks or uh, anything of that nature. This is a shift or change in focus of awareness from what's in the, the center of your attention uh, to what is in the periphery of your awareness. And this can be used in, in multiple uh, environments within the perioperative setting, uh, including the operating rooms, but also uh, where we've been using it quite a bit is in the off-site kind of domain, which includes MRI settings, uh, bone marrow, uh, interventional radiology, just to name a few. So that's primarily where we're using it. When did you first put your skills to the test? Yeah, it's been several years now. And actually, I'll, just to give you a brief example, um, commonly anesthesiologists were called in to sedate patients who are claustrophobic for MRIs. And there's actually quite a lot of data that exists already in that environment of MRIs and the use of, of hypnosis to relax patients, decrease their needs for medication, and also to decrease uh, scan incompletions, meaning if a patient is more comfortable staying still, then the this, this scan, the MRI scan, can actually be completed. And I've had several patients over the uh, last couple of years where I, I use some of the techniques that I learned to uh, calm patients, relax them, and kind of go through the process of a, a formal hypnotic induction. In addition to that, it, it, uh, it speaks to patient rapport, uh, getting to know a patient a little bit uh, more than we typically do, and also using our bodies, our body language to invite a patient to uh, to become a part of their own care in a sense, to actually empower patients to uh, step up to the plate, so to speak, and tap into their inner resources to make it easier on, on everybody, especially themselves. How does medical hypnosis differ from what people might commonly think of it like a parlor trick or a yeah. magician's trick? Yeah, the, they're actually uh, two completely different uh, uh, animals. The, kind of the parlor trick, uh, party trick type stuff is more of uh, sh what I would classify as a sham hypnosis. Usually these people are in on it. The participants, uh, you know, have a stake in it or the person may whisper, hey, if you go along with this, you know, I'll give you some cash or something like that. These are... Uh, I actually wish there was a, a different word for it. We, we, we refer to it as the H word or uh, guided uh, imagery, uh, focused relaxation, kind of, kind of things like that. What this is, this is just a shift in awareness, and the, the patient is actually in control uh, the entire time. It's not mind control. We don't make them do things that they don't want to do. We're just setting up uh, an environment and inviting them into an experience that uh, will relax them and get them through whatever procedure or scan or test that they're having with uh, with dignity. How do you invoke that state? I mean, obviously, again, harking back to the typical imagery or the stereotypical yeah. imagery we see is focusing on a shiny or spinning object. Correct. How do, exactly do you guide them into this state? That's, that's a great question. I, I think part of the reason as an anesthesiologist that I'm interested in this, and uh, probably a very small part, but in anesthesia, uh, there's a, an induction, meaning patients go to sleep. There's a maintenance. We keep them asleep and then an actual emergence uh, where we wake them up after, after uh, an anesthetic. And procedural or medical type hypnosis actually has those three uh, factors in it as well. There's uh, an induction, a maintenance, and an emergence phase. During the induction phase, and there's actually 
countless uh, numbers of types of induction. The one that we use primarily, uh, devised by Dr. Elvira Lang, is called an eye roll technique. And what you do is invite the patient to look up, take a deep breath, count backwards from three to one, and, and follow some other very simple instructions to sort of unlock or uh, expand the mind and be more open to uh, suggestion. Now, as far as if someone is, and obviously you're an anesthesiologist, so yeah. you're dealing with these people in the perioperative or before surgery yeah. um, time. When do you do this? Is it, I guess the anesthesia is given first and then you do the hypnosis yeah. or what's the sequence of events? Yeah, the, uh, it depends on the setting. Uh, in several of, of these MRI cases, uh, there's no anesthesia needed at all, no pharmacology, no drugs. Uh, so we do it while the patient's actually kind of walking into the, the MRI scanner. But really, if we just backtrack a little bit, the whole process of uh, patient rapport and kind of setting uh, the stage for this begins with the first, the patient's first encounter with uh, with the, the first person they meet on uh, for their procedure, the receptionist at the desk. And what this uh, entails is kind of a way of speaking to somebody where you emphasize positive suggestions uh, or neutral suggestions and uh, avoid negative suggestions and really uh, allow the patient to feel like they have a sense of control, that they're not being led kind of blindly down, uh, you know, to, to a scanner and where they've perhaps had bad experiences and it's important important to differentiate that this experience will be different than the last experience. In the operating room, uh, I use some of the language, uh, if I'm putting in an epidural or even starting an IV, there's quite a few induction techniques for ne needle phobia, for example. Uh, and I'll use language and my body language and, and things of that nature really to, to uh, relax the patient to where a lot of the, the medicine that we give kind of up front to relax patients uh, isn't even needed. How do you, and you say there's, there are phases to this hypnosis, how do you know when they've reached the optimal phase? I mean, yeah. it's not like waving a hand in front of their face or, or whatever. How do you know that they're yeah. in that state? Um, I would describe it as a spectrum. Uh, some patients are highly hypnotizable. Some patients are not so much. And there's, there's different scales and ways to figure out who is or who is not hypnotizable. So the way, for example, I, I, I'm going to MRIs, but if I switch to bone marrow, for example, uh, in the hospital on a daily basis, there's anywhere from 75 to 100 bone marrow aspirations and biopsies that are done. About 10% of those we see in anesthesia, and we essentially do an almost a general anesthetic for those patients. Um, it's a very fast procedure. The other 90% of patients get that done up in the clinic with no sedation. And just with a, a, a local anesthetic at the site, we're called in to assist with a, a sedation for that 10% if, they've had, if patients have had a prior bad experience or if uh, they're on some pain medication or have some kind of comorbid uh, issues. Um, related to pain or anxiety, uh, things of that nature. So what we would do in, in that sense is induce the patient uh, using the whatever induction technique uh, we like, which, as I said, is kind of an eye roll type technique, uh, and then prep the patient and give them medicines on an as-needed type basis. How do you introduce this to the patient? I mean, Obviously, you know, hypnosis has weird connotations, like it or not. Um, how do you introduce the, the technique to them, and what sort of people do you introduce this to? Yeah. So the, uh, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. It is important to differentiate what we're doing, which is procedural-based hypnosis. It's, it's a short intervention. There's, it, this isn't psychotherapy. Uh, we don't uh, take patients back into their childhood or, or, or a anything of that nature. And the, the invitation is essentially an open one. It's, would you like to learn a way uh, how to relax? And it's, uh, if the patient is receptive, then, uh, then we go for it. And we go into some detail as to kind of what we're doing. But the, the uh, kind of the, the blueprint of a uh, procedural type hypnosis is actually a script. And anybody can read a script. And it's literally 
uh, one or two pages of of something that's been drafted already with very uh, deliberate language in there. Some of it's confusional. Uh, some of it uh, grounds a person uh, in, in a place of safety, for example. And so every word within these scripts that we use, it's all deliberate. There's not one wasted word. And those of us that are trained in, in doing it uh, essentially read the script. How many times do you use hypnosis in a typical year here at MD Anderson? We're, that's a great question, too. We're, we're just, I would describe this as we're at the infancy of, of introducing it. It's, it is kind of outside the box. Uh, in my department, there's four of us that are trained in doing it. Uh, myself, Dr. Kenneth Sapphire, Dr. Shreyas Bavsar, and Dr. Jag Singh. And among the four of us, true formal inductions, I would say on a monthly basis, perhaps, maybe 10 or 15, something like that. But again, it's it's tough to differentiate a, a true uh, hypnosis from uh, a lot of these rapport techniques that we've learned, which all of us use every day with every patient interaction. And what about uh, clinical or other types of research? Have you like measured brain scans of people who have undergone hypnosis? Have you been able to have a causal relationship between hypnosis and the decreased use of like drugs or sedation. Yeah, yeah there's there's actually a, a huge body of evidence uh, that already exists, uh, specifically with MRIs, uh, outpatient type procedures, and over in Europe they're performing thyroid surgeries under local uh, anesthesia and hypnosis. Are you yourself involved? In, is MD Anderson involved in any research on Ye- this? Yes. Yeah, so there, there's a couple of protocols that we're writing up at the moment. Um, one specifically. Uh, you spoke about brain waves. There's a device that we use in the operating room that is a, for lack of a better term, a processed EEG, and we use it under general anesthesia to kind of measure the depth of sedation of a patient who's under general anesthesia. And uh, we're plant, we're writing up a protocol to see after a hypnotic induction if we we put these monitors on. It's just a simple strip uh, that goes across somebody's forehead to see exactly what that number is going to be to see if it will uh, reduce uh, to a comparable level uh, of general anesthesia or pharmacological sedation. Another uh, protocol uh, that, that we're currently doing is, is here in the hospital we do, we're one of the busiest centers for awake craniotomies. And without going into too much detail, depending on where a patient's brain tumor is, um, we have to wake them up during surgery to assess their speech or motor uh, before the surgeon actually takes the the portion of tumor out, so I'm working with one of the sur- one of the newer surgeons here, Doctor uh, Doctor Prabhu, in getting something going because there is some evidence. Uh, there's a guy in Germany, an anesthesiologist, who does these awake craniotomies under a local uh, with no medication, just hypnosis and the local uh, kind of numbing medicine. And in closing, what would you say if, if should patients even bring this up or should, I mean, how, how should this be approached? I mean, obviously you have people who aren't going to do an MRI no matter what. Um, yeah. Is it something they should proactively ask for or how do they broach the subject? Yeah. Like I said, at the moment, this is so new to the hospital that, there's not too many of us that even know what it is, and people's own uh, kind of knowledge or thought process about what hypnosis is uh, may persuade them not to even investigate something like this. But let me assure you that, again, it's not, this isn't a sham type thing. This is just a shift in consciousness or awareness to provide more compassionate care to uh uh, to the patients. And I do know here at, at our complementary therapy in the Integrative Medicine Center, we actually teach people things like guided imagery and self-hypnosis techniques. Yeah. So it's just kind of working that into the clinical setting. Yes, and actually I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I'm, I'm also working with uh, Dr. Lorenzo Cohen, Dr. Rich Lee, and uh, Dr. Uh, Alejandro Chaul, along with some of my anesthesia uh, partners and my chairman, Tom Ralphs and Kenneth Sapphire, to actually introduce a wellness uh, program for the perioperative uh, enterprise for uh, patients undergoing surgery. I view hypnosis as as one piece of a a puzzle uh, within this wellness program that also includes yoga and meditation and uh, guided imagery 
uh, nutrition, exercise, uh, music therapy, massage, kind of all these things to prep patients and to guide them and help them through uh, kind of the, the six or eight weeks before an operation while they're perhaps undergoing some chemo uh, or radiation and then on the day of surgery and then also in the recovery period, which, you know, may take a week or six weeks or, or something like that. So that's a project that we've just initiated and it, it's underway at the moment. So in summary, what is your your final hope or your or your goal in, in, in integrating hypnosis into the clinical setting? Yeah, the, the, the ultimate goal is to prov- provide more compassionate care to patients and uh, kind of to change the culture of the uh, doctor-patient relationship and to actually shift the focus of power perhaps somewhat away from the physician and nurses and PAs and actually uh, have the patients uh, be more empowered and feel more in control of their treatment uh, process. Hypnosis, uh, that seems like a, perhaps a lofty goal through hypnosis, but uh, again, uh, I see the, the procedural aspects of this uh, just as one piece of more of a larger picture of overall wellness and well-being. Great. Interesting stuff. Thank you very much, Dr. Nipsky. My, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you have questions about anything you've heard today on Cancer Newsline, contact Ask MD Anderson at 1-877-MDA-6789 or online at mdanderson.org slash ask. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cancer Newsline. Tune in for the next podcast in our series.